this morning, we're very fortunate to be hearing from Dr. Greg Stone. Uh, Dr. Stone received his medical degree from Johns Hopkins in 1982 and then completed residency in internal medicine at Cornell, followed by cardiology fellowship at Senior Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles and interventional cardiology training at the St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute in Kansas City, Missouri. Prior to joining Mount Sinai in 2015, Dr. Stone held leadership positions in interventional cardiology and cardiovascular research at Stanford University Medical Center and Washington Medical Center, and then most recently as Director of Cardiovascular Research and Education at the Center for International Vascular Therapy, Interventional Vascular Therapy at New York Presbyterian. At Mount Sinai, he currently serves as Professor of Medicine and Professor of Population Health Sciences and Policy at the Zena and Michael A. Wiener Cardiovascular Institute, as well as being Director of Academic Affairs for Mount Sinai Heart. He has led dozens of clinical trials, published well over a thousand peer-reviewed journal articles, and is the director of the world's largest interventional cardiology and vascular medicine symposium, uh, Transcatheter Cardiovascular Therapeutics. Uh, please welcome this morning, Dr. Greg Stone. Well, great. Hi, everybody. It's fantastic to be here with you this morning uh, in this new virtual world. I wish we were all together, but I'm really honored to be able to uh, give you this grand rounds on the different treatment options and approaches that we have for uh, mitral regurgitation. So let me share my screen here. Let's see, here we go. Okay, you should be seeing my screen now. Let's see if I get rid of that. Yeah, we can okay. see that. Great, now it should be in full screen. Okay, so these are my disclosures as relates to uh, the valve therapeutics field. So when we think about mitral regurgitation, we actually have to realize that there are numerous different etiologies and causes of MR. It's the most common valve disorder there is, even more common than aortic stenosis. And so it's really important to be able to recognize it and appropriately triage patients to treatment. And I'm gonna talk today mostly about treatment. Uh, so even though it's complicated because there are so many different causes, we basically break it down into two causes primary or degenerative mitral regurgitation, where the problem is the valve itself, and then secondary or functional mitral regurgitation, where the valve structure is relatively normal, but the problem is dilated cardiomyopathy, either on ischemic or idiopathic or other basis, which then leads to LV dilatation that distorts the um, geomet geometric positioning of the papillary muscles. The cords then pull on the leaflets, and actually won't keep, let them coap, won't let them approximate or close, and you get secondary MR because of geometric distortion of the valve leaflets. So for primary MR, of course, mitral valve prolapse is the most common disease. We're talking also fibroelastic deficiency, Barlow's disease, uh, endocarditis, um, rheumatic MR, uh, mitral clefts, et cetera. And here, surgical leaflet repair usually gives excellent outcomes when done at centers of excellence. So the real advantage that the surgeons have, and they've been perfecting these techniques over you know, greater than 30 years, is they have numerous different approaches depending on exactly the morphologic disturbances of the valve. Um, depending on the amount of the redundant tissue, which leaflets or scallops are involved, whether the annulus involved, whether there's a torn papillary muscle or cord, et cetera. Um, so the standard techniques are quadrangular resection, sliding leaflet plasty, chordal transfers, cleft closures. Um, they almost always do a ring annual plasty as well. And, and of course, if it's just too complex so you can't repair it, then there's always the option for mitral valve replacement. And there are many newer techniques that um, are not as universally used yet, but different surgeons are applying them um, uh, uh, selectively, but successfully, including quarter replacement, posterior leaflet augmentation, the edge-to-edge -edge Alfieri stitch, which I, um, you've got a picture of here, and I'm gonna talk a lot about this later, papillary muscle approximation, posterior wall reduction, et cetera. Now, mitral valve repair is considered the gold standard for um, uh, degenerative mitral regurgitation. And that's despite the fact that there's never been a randomized trial of surgical mitral valve repair in degenerative MR compared to medical therapy. But there have been numerous different large observational studies to suggest that after a good mitral valve repair, it basically returns the patient to their age and sex matched uh, survival. And we know that the recurrence rate is very low. The reoperation rate should be only about uh, um, uh, less than 10% at 10 years. 
and uh, their functional status is excellent. So for this reason, good surgical mitral valve repair is class one in the guidelines for degenerative MR. Now for secondary or functional MR, it's a different story. And again, it's a totally different disease. The disease is actually the left ventricle. The valve is relatively normal until late. And when we talk about the mitral valve, we're talking about a, a mitral valve complex. You've got to realize, again, it's not just an aortic valve of three leaflets. It's a mitral valve of two leaflets. And then it's the annulus and it's the, um, pap the um, chordae tendinae, the papillary muscles, the myocardium under the papillary muscles. And all that is very dependent on LV function. So whether you have ischemic cardiomyopathy or idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, again, you can get um, usually posterior and apical dislocation of the papillary muscles, and that can pull on or tether the anterior and posterior leaflets, keeping them from uh, co-apting. With ischemic cardiomyopathy, you usually get a posterior jet because you've got major involvement of the posterolateral wall. In idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, the process tends to be more global, so you'll tend to get a central jet, but the mechanism is really the same. Uh, and again, the structure of the valve itself stays normal. Uh, there might be some small fibrotic changes and late in the course because of chronic volume overload, the um, annulus will dilate uh, because the left atrium will dilate. Now, in about 10% of the cases, the cause is not primary LV, the cause is primary left atrium. And that's called atrial functional MR. And that's usually due to chronic atrial fibrillation where you can get a um, uh, left atrial dilatation over time where the left ventricle is not necessarily that enlarged. And that's more primary annular dilatation, but it causes the same process. It keeps the relatively normal leaflets from co-apting. So what do we do? And what do we know about secondary MR? Because secondary MR in heart failure is actually more common than primary MR. Well, we've known for a long time that there's a strong relationship between the presence and the quantitative severity of secondary mitral regurgitation and both mortality and heart failure hospitalization. And this has been shown again and again. And by multivariable analysis, the presence and severity of functional MR is actually an independent predictor of both death and heart failure um, hospitalization, even after adjustment for other echocardiographic and biomarkers and medications, et cetera. But again, the question has always been, is this just a marker of really bad ventricular dysfunction, or is the additional volume overload that the mitral regurgitation causes actually um, uh, contributing to the primary prog uh, poor prognosis of these patients? So the vicious cycle of secondary MR is described where you have global or regional LV dysfunction that causes LV dilatation, that causes mitral leaflet tethering in MR, that causes volume overload and LV dilatation even more so that further causes mitral leaflet tethering and further MR, and then you get this vicious cycle because of ongoing more and more volume overload. But the real question has always been, if we do something about just the MR itself without affecting the underlying left ventricular dysfunction, will that improve the prognosis? And actually from the surgical literature, we don't have much evidence that it will. Once again, there's no randomized trials of um, surgery versus, versus standard of care, which is medical therapy in heart failure patients with isolated secondary MR. But there are, again, a lot of observational studies, the most common, um, most widely cited of which is this one from Steve Bowling, one of the country's best mitral surgeons from the University of Michigan. And actually, there's no difference in the prognosis of medical therapy versus surgery in patients with functional mitral regurgitation. And the prognosis is very bad in both of these patients. And this tends to be a relatively high mortality and morbidity procedure because these patients often have reduced ejection fractions, they're elder, more elderly, they have renal insufficiency, anemia, and multiple other comorbidities. One of the other issues in um, secondary mitral regurgitation is that there tends to be a higher recurrence rate than after a surgeon fixes primary mitral regurgitation. So there is a randomized trial in severe mitral regurgitation called the CTSN severe MR trial, which was actually uh, coordinated um, uh, at Mount Sinai in, in Inquire. 
And here though, it was a randomized trial of mitral valve replacement versus repair in isolated severe secondary MR. Uh, and as you can see, there was no overall difference in any of the overall outcomes. In contrast to degenerative MR, where patients seem to have a much better prognosis after good mitral valve repair than mitral valve replacement. And one of the other things that was noticed was not only was there no difference in, in MACE or death or heart failure hospitalizations or even LV volumes, but there was a high recurrence rate after um, mitral valve repair surgery for secondary MR. And the usual surgery for secondary MR is just an undersized ring annuloplasty. And the problem is that doesn't get at the underlying problem, which is lack of coaptation. So even though you, you prevent that annulus from dilating with um, an effective ring annuloplasty, over time, the excess volume overload, the ventricle will keep dilating, you'll keep getting more tethering, and the MR can recur. So in about 59% of the cases, at least moderate MR recurred within two years after surgery, where the recurrence rate was much, much less after mitral valve replacement. So if you do have surgery for secondary MR, for many surgeons, mitral valve replacement has become the standard of care, even though patients need to be anticoagulated, uh, et cetera. And if you look at the outcomes of all of this now, if you look at isolated mitral valve surgery, again, in the United States, by far the vast number of surgeries are done for degenerative lethal, leaflet prolapse and then other uh, causes of degenerative MR, such as rheumatic heart disease, et cetera. Only 4% of isolated mitral valve operations are done for functional MR, about 700 per year, which of course is nothing in the United States. And for secondary MR, until recently, the uh, treatment of choice has just been underlying medical therapy for heart failure and cardiac resynchronization therapy, if appropriate. So if we now look at the indications for mitral valve surgery, you can see here, if we take primary MR, the number one thing to first do is figure out if, it's, if you take MR, is it primary MR or is it secondary MR? If it's primary MR, then we have to ask ourselves, is it severe MR? Right now, there's only indications to operate on severe MR. And usually it's symptomatic MR, and it's better to operate when the left ventricular ejection fraction is greater than 30%, then you get a class one indication. If the EF is less than 30%, then it's a class 2B, again, because of higher uh, periprocedural mortality and complications. But there's also a path even for asymptomatic um, degenerative mitral regurgitation, according to the left ventricular function, um, left ventricular dilatation, nuance at AFib or pulmonary pressures. Here, you can at least get class 2A indications to operate. And it is in part dependent on whether or not you think you can get a good mitral valve repair with at least 95% success rate. For secondary MR though, the general therapy for secondary MR is heart failure medications. Uh, and in fact, it, only if you have symptomatic severe MR, stage D MR, with persistent symptoms despite medical therapies, then can you even consider surgery. Sorry, let me go back. Then should you even consider surgery, and then it's only a class 2B indication. Uh, and again, as I showed you, it's very rarely done for that indication, unless you're also doing bypass surgery, and then you happen to stick a ring in at the same time. Now, in the background of all of this, um, there's been a furious um, uh, uh, effort by hundreds of different companies to develop transcatheter approaches to mitral valve repair and replacement in particular. Uh, and this is just a, a, a list of the ones that are still active. And I'm keeping track of this, but here you can see about 60 different types of devices. And in red is the ones that have been in humans. Um, the other ones are ones that are still under development. Um, and basically, interventional cardiologists in general, most of the time, do a good job when they can copy what's been done successfully by the surgeons, but do it in a less invasive um, uh, way, easier for the patient with fewer periprocedural complications. So when you look at the different types of devices that have been developed, they're the edge-to-edge -edge techniques. And I'm gonna talk a lot about this. There's direct and indirect annuloplasty. There's mitral valve replacement. Everyone, uh, everyone's been trying to copy the success of aortic valve replacement with mitral valve replacement. 
um, from a transcatheter approach, but it's been much, much more difficult. And then there's other approaches. There's neocords, there's posterior leaflet augmentation, there's spacers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess you can first ask, well, why do we need so many devices? I mean, for aortic stenosis, it's TAVR, right? It's one device. It's transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Well, I think you have to realize the reason is, is that the mitral valve complex is complex. It's much, much more complicated than the aortic valve. In fact, calcific aortic stenosis is one of the most simple diseases we deal with in medicine. It's like a cork in the bottle. Remove the cork, patient gets better. But here, as I mentioned, there's numerous different causes and etiologies. And you've got to realize the mitral valve itself is not even round. Um, it's uh, not purely D-shaped. It's somewhat D-shaped, but it's more asymmetric. It's not flat. It's like a saddle on a horse. Um, the annulus, unlike the aortic annulus, is not rigid. It's dynamic. It contracts and expands with systole. Um, it reduces valve area during systole. It's a high pressure closing valve, not a high pressure opening valve like the aortic valve. There's at least 24 cords. It's, it's very close to the aortic outflow. So whatever you do to the mitral valve, it's easy to mess up the aortic outflow and block it. It's much more easier to form thrombus on the mitral valve and get hemolysis. It's got a much larger annulus. It tends not to calcify as much as the aortic valve. Um, the annulus changes size and shape as the heart fails. And again, as I mentioned, there's just numerous different causes of the failure of each one of these components. So there's no one size fits all solution for mitral valve disease, either in surgery or with transcatheter approaches. Now, we have one transcatheter approach which has been proven to have utility. It is an important um, uh, uh, role for patients with both primary and secondary MR. And as an interventional cardiologist, I've been involved with this device and, and I've been researching it for about a decade. And this is the MitroClip system. And probably most of you are very familiar with this. Uh, so a man named Ottavio Alfieri in Milano uh, ha developed an approach um, several decades ago to patients with severe MR who were just too sick to undergo standard surgery. And he found that if he just stitched the anterior and posterior leaflets together, he could reduce mitral regurgitation. And it was a ridiculously simple surgery. It would take 10 minutes for a surgeon once the heart's exposed to do this. Um, now, there, it was questionable how much it worked. Um, and the critics said it didn't work that well. Um, but he basically said, well, the only reason you're not getting the results you usually get from an um, other type of repair is that these patients are much sicker than the ones you usually operate on. So anyway, a company called Eval developed a transcatheter approach to this. And basically it's this device, it's a catheter that you pass from the um, uh, right femoral vein into the right atrium, then through a transeptal puncture into the left atrium. Then you go from the left atrium across the mitral valve into the left ventral. And there's this polyethylene um, uh, fabric coated clip, which then opens up and it's got these graspers which will then grasp the anterior and posterior mitral leaflets and clip them together, creating this so-called double orifice or bow tie or butterfly repair. And that will reduce mitral regurgitation. Now, sometimes you have to put two of them in, rarely even three of them in. And as you do that, you again, make the orifice smaller and smaller. So you've got to be careful because you can cause mitral stenosis, but usually one or two clips does not cause mitral stenosis. And that's something that we can test in the cath lab. And this is what it looks like. This is um, a human explant from a surgical alfieri stitch, and you can see the double orifice. And this is what a mitroclip looks like in a porcine heart at six months. And again, it looks almost identical. You can see how it endothelializes and creates this permanent bridge. So this was first studied um, more than a decade ago in an early randomized trial, which at the time was the first randomized trial in the entire mitral valve space. And this was in the early learning curve of this um, device called the Everest II randomized trial. And it was 279 patients who were low risk patients because they were surgical candidates. And they had severe MR and they were randomized to either treatment with the mitral clip or treatment with surgery. Um, surgical repair was recommended, but replacement was possible if surgical repair wasn't. Now, 
even back then, just to show you when this trial started, which was about 15 years ago, we didn't understand how important this distinction was between primary and secondary MR. And both of them were allowed in this study as long as the patients were low risk. So they had an indication back then for primary surgery. So about three quarters of the patients had degenerative MR and about a quarter of the patients had functional MR. So the, um, there were primary safety and primary effectiveness outcomes. And as you would imagine, this device um, approach to MR was much safer than surgery in these patients. Even though these are relatively low risk patients, they're still high risk for complications. And there were only 10% adverse events versus 57% after surgery. And most of this was less bleeding, but there were a few less strokes, a few less deaths, infections, prolonged intubation, et cetera, et cetera. But unfortunately, um, the uh, mitral clip was not as effective as surgery. So defining effectiveness as freedom from death, mitral valve surgery or reoperation for mitral valve dysfunction or recurrent severe mitral regurgitation, the mitral clip was only effective in 72% of the patients versus 88% for surgery. Uh, and most of this was because of recurrent severe MR or the lack of being able to reduce MR at baseline. And again, the mitral clip was only successful in about 78% of the patients up front. And that's, again, it was a very early learning curve tied for this device. Now, interestingly, when you looked at subgroups, uh, there was only one subgroup that seemed to have any sort of interaction between the outcomes of mitral clip versus surgery. And that was whether or not the patients had functional or degenerative MR. And if the patients had degenerative MR, at both one year and five years, surgery was much more effective than the mitral clip. But if the patients had functional MR, then there was equipoise. There was no real differences between surgery and the mitral clip. If anything, the um, uh, endpoints slightly favored the mitral clip. But you'll note this is a small number of patients. You see how wide the confidence intervals are. They cross the unity line. And remember, I told you back then we didn't even know if you could improve the prognosis by treating functional MR. So with the mitral clip being as good as surgery, maybe that means that both of them are ineffective, okay? And again, it's a, it's a subgroup analysis from a negative trial, so it's only at best hypothesis generating. So based on this trial, surgical mitral valve repair clearly remained the standard of care for degenerative mitral regurgitation. But there was at the same time this trial was ongoing, there was a parallel registry in patients who were too sick for surgery. So some patients who will develop a, a primary MR, uh, let's say due to a cortal rupture or a severe Barlow's disease or something, are just too sick for surgery. Uh, and these excluded patients that are so-called prohibitive risk for surgery were entered into a registry with treatment with the mitral clip. And this was a total of 127 patients. Their mean age was 82 years. Um, almost all of them were in New York Heart Association class three or four um, heart failure. Their mean STS score was 13.2%. So expecting a 13% 30-day procedural mortality. So a very sick population. In this group, the mitral clip implant success was 95%. And they only stayed in the hospital for three days. So, I mean, it, it was a very smooth sailing. Now, they certainly were not free of complications in these very high-risk patients. 6% of them died within 30 days, although that's a little better than what you would have predicted at 13%. And there were some MIs, some strokes, and other complications, but overall, it was probably on the order of about 15%. When you looked at the um, uh, MR grades through one year, you could see, as we always see, the mitral clip does not eliminate mitral regurgitation but it reduced it from three to four plus in nearly all patients down to one to two plus in most patients at discharge. And for the most part, this was maintained at one year. So there wasn't interestingly a high recurrence rate unlike after a ring annuloplasty. And that's a clue to what we were gonna see later. The left ventricular volumes decreased within one year suggesting good effect by reducing some volume overload from the mitral regurgitation. And the patients clearly felt better. Now this is not blinded and this is not randomized, but again, almost all the patients had class three or four heart failure and at discharge and in one year, um, most of them had class one or two heart failure, about 
if you looked at uh, um, uh, the SF12 score, um, their physical component score and mental component score markedly increased more than a 10 point improvement and actually got back to near normals for their ages. And probably most interestingly and provocative that before the mitral clip, these patients were being hospitalized for heart failure at about two out of three patients per year. And after the mitral clip in the following year, that was reduced to about one out of five. So a 73% reduction. And as a result, in October of 2013, the FDA approved the mitral clip for treatments of severe primary degenerative MR who are prohibitive risk for mitral valve surgery. Uh, so again, you should always think mitral valve repair surgery first for primary or degenerative MR, but if the patients are too sick, then the mitral clip can offer a, a symptomatic benefit at least. And this has worked its way into the um, uh, guidelines. Again, I won't go through this in detail, but if the patient is not a candidate for surgery, um, then uh, if the patient is a candidate for transcatheter therapy, they've got to have the right kind of anatomy for the mitral clip, et cetera, then you can consider the mitral clip, although the level of evidence is only class, the, the recommendation is only class 2B, level of evidence B, but it's in the guidelines. And until very recently, that was because of this is the way that it would get reimbursed in the country, by far the most common um, uh, disease process that the mitral clip was used for uh, in the United States, prohibitive risk DMR. But what about functional MR? Functional MR, even more common than degenerative MR, but we had no data that the mitral clip or any other therapy was beneficial. So, if you looked at the guidelines um, up to about just three years ago for fucking shingle MR, the only class one guideline therapies were to treat the underlying heart failure. And that was with medical therapy, beta blockers, ACE, ARBs, or ARNIs, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, and cardiac resynchronization therapy, if appropriate. That's left bundle branch block and QRS greater than 150 milliseconds. Now, um, those therapies clearly improve the prognosis of heart failure. And in about a third of patients, they would also reduce secondary MR, probably because they're reducing the size of the left ventricle. Although they didn't do anything directly for the mitral valve itself, except possibly CRT, which by restoring normal synchrony can improve left ventricular closing forces. Uh, but both surgery and the mitral clip at best were class 2B indications. And in fact, in the US valve guidelines, they didn't even mention TMVR. So at this time, there were two randomized trials that were being done in the world to look to see if the mitral clip would be beneficial in heart failure patients with secondary mitral regurgitation uh, compared to medical therapy alone, because medical therapy alone is the standard of care for these patients. And the first trial was the mitral FR trial. And this was done in France. Um, in 300 patients with secondary MR due to LV dysfunction, ejection fractions of 15 to 40% who had symptomatic heart failure who were on medical therapy. And they were randomized to the mitral clip plus medical therapy or medical therapy alone. And this was presented in 2018 at the European Society of Cardiology. And it was absolutely a negative trial. And the primary endpoint was death or heart failure hospitalization. And looking at the mitral clip group in green versus the medical therapy alone group in blue, there was absolutely no differences and no differences in any of the component endpoints, quality of life, nothing else. And from this, the authors and many people concluded, well, obviously the problem is the left ventricle, the problem is not the mitral valve and just fixing the mitral valve without fixing the ventricle doesn't do anything. And you notice in one year, about 50% of the patients had death or heart failure hospitalization. Uh, these are really sick patients. Now at the same time for, we had been running for about four years, the COAP trial. And this was a more ambitious study that was done in the United States and Canada. It was about twice the size, 614 patients. And on its surface, it looked pretty similar. We took patients with symptomatic heart failure with either three plus or four plus severe secondary mitral regurgitation who remained symptomatic despite maximally tolerated guideline directed medical therapy. 
And this was one difference, um, and I'm gonna to get to this later, but we only took pay people who were failing medical therapy and they had to be on really high doses of these drugs or have tried them. And they had to have CRT if appropriate, but they still were symptomatic. They still had secondary MR. So we controlled the medical regimens in both groups where in mitra FR, the medical regimens were allowed to vary in both groups. So we randomized these patients one-to-one -to, -one to either the MitraClip plus guideline-directed medical therapy versus guideline-directed medical therapy alone. And our primary effectiveness endpoint was all hospitalizations for heart failure within 24 months. And in contrast to the MitraFR trial, which showed no benefit, we showed a marked reduction in heart failure hospitalizations with MitraClip therapy here. And you'll note that the curves separated almost immediately. And there was a huge difference at one year and a huge difference in two years. So there was a 47% reduction um, in heart failure hospitalizations. The p-value is 0. 0.000006. Looking at this on an incidence rate, 68% of control patients per year were being hospitalized for heart failure versus 36% per year after the MitraClip. The number needed to treat, number of patients needed to treat to prevent a heart failure hospitalization was only three patients, which is very low. And the, sec the second major endpoint was safety. And the MitraClip, I won't go into all the details of this, but the MitraClip is one of the safest things that we do in the cath lab. And the FDA would have accepted a 12% complication rate to get that kind of heart failure benefit. And we had a complication rate of only 3.4%. And most of these were not major complications. Most importantly, when you follow the patients through two years, we saw a reduction in all-cause mortality, and it was a sizable reduction. Notice that about 46% of the control patients died in two years. This is almost like cancer, this disease. Half the patients dying in two years, despite really being optimally treated with medical therapy. In contrast with the MitraClip, while we didn't cure them, by reducing that extra volume overload, we reduced their mortality um, from 46 to 29%, an absolute 17% reduction or a number needed to treat of about six patients to prevent one death um, in the entire population over two years. You'll also note that in contrast to the marked um, reduction in heart failure hospitalizations here, you don't see any benefit in mortality initially. You gotta give it time and over time, the left ventricle remodels, it decreases its size, and this contributes to the improvement in mortality. Now, to try to put this in perspective as to how effective this was, um, if you take patients with HEFREF, that's patients with an ejection fraction of less than um, a 50, a 40%, most class one guideline directed drugs to save a life have a number needed to treat of 20 to 50 to save a life within two years. So you got to treat 20 to 50 patients to save one life. In this population, in this heart failure range, the MitraClip, on top of all these other therapies, you only had to treat five patients to save one life. So extraordinarily effective compared to what we've seen before. In addition, um, the progressive LV disease was prevented um, or uh, mitigated in many patients. So the incidence of both need for LVADs and heart transplants were reduced by about two thirds. The patients felt better, their exercise capacity was better, uh, et cetera. We've now followed these patients out to three years and you can see the curves continue to diverge. This is about 10 zeros followed by a one. So there's no statistical chance that this was just a play of chance um, at three years. And, if, and at two years, what was unique is that we allowed patients to cross over in the control arm. And if you start crossing over patients, now they start adopting the overall death or heart failure rates of the treatment arm. So the point being here is you wanna treat earlier rather than later, but even for patients with longstanding established heart failure, it's never too late to start treating. So why are these trials so different? On their face, they looked relatively similar, um, MITRE-FR versus COAPT, with death or heart failure hospitalization at two years, no difference versus a marked difference. Uh, why were, what's the cause? Because this is very important implications for how we choose patients who may benefit in COAPT and may not benefit in MITRE-FR. So it turns out that there's probably at least three important ways that these trials were different. 
Um, even though the ejection fraction ranges were similar, about 30% mean in both trials, they defined mitral regurgitation and LV dysfunction differently. So in mitral FR, they used the European criteria for what was severe MR. And they call that in heart failure, either an effective regurgitant orifice area of 20 millimeters squared or a regurgitant volume of 30 mLs per beat. In contrast, the US guidelines said that's only moderate MR and we want really severe MR and we use the US guidelines which required an ERA of greater than 30 millimeters squared or pulmonary systolic venous flow reversal or other indications of very severe MR. So if you look at the mean ERA, it was only 31 millimeters squared in mitra FR, which we would consider on the borderline of severe, where it was 41 millimeters squared in COAPT, which is quite severe. In addition, mitra FR included any ventricular size. They didn't cap the size of the left ventricle. Uh, and in COAPT, we didn't want patients who had end-stage LV disease. So in addition to capping the lower limit of ejection fraction at 20%, we also capped the upper size of the ventricle with a left ventricular end systolic dimension of less than seven centimeters. And as a result, if you looked at the left ventricular end diastolic volume index, in mitra FR, the ventricles were about twice the normal size, where in COAP, they were about 40% increased compared to the normal size. So mitra FR had less MR in the much larger ventricles, COAP had a lot more MR into somewhat smaller ventricles. So to understand this better, you have to understand this relationship between EROA and left ventricular volume. And if you look at a regurgitant fraction of 50%, the Gorlin equation, which you know, developed when Gorlin was at Mount Sinai, shows that there's a relationship between the left ventricular and diastolic volume and the calculated effective regurgitant orifice area. Uh, and when the LVEDV increases, if you want to have severe MR, you've got to have a very high EROA. Whereas in contrast, if the left ventricle is not dilated yet, a small EROA down to as low as 0.2 might be severe MR. And this will also depend on the um, left ventricular systolic pressure, the left atrial pressure, ejection fraction, and other parameters. So... Paul Grayburn and colleagues, um, Milt Packer and others um, in Texas came up with this concept of disproportionately severe MR versus proportionally severe MR versus non-severe MR, relating the mean LV and diastolic volume to the EROA. And basically, if we assume that a regurgitant fraction of 50% or greater going backwards instead of forwards is severe MR, which is widely accepted, you would have this range, this gray bar is kind of a, a, um, a range of what would be considered severe MR. And they call this proportionally severe MR. So disproportionately severe MR is really just very severe MR, where the EROA is really, really high compared to the LVEDV. Proportionally severe MR is kind of garden variety severe MR, and non-severe MR is non-severe MR. So if you look at the population means, you could see COAP, the ventricles were smaller, and on average, these patients had very severe MR. In mitra FR, the ventricles were much larger, and they were on the borderline of having severe MR and non-severe MR. And of course, these patients would be expected to benefit greatly from MR reduction, these patients would benefit somewhat from our reduction and these patients would not. Now, of course, there's a cloud around all of these patients. Um, so COAPT probably enrolled mostly very severe MR patients where mitra FR enrolled mostly severe MR and a lot of non-severe MR patients. So here, for example, are three ventricles, all of whom have a measured EROA of 30 millimeters squared. This patient, had just a posterior lateral infarct. The ventricle is quite small and he's got a lot of MR. This patient would be expected to benefit greatly from MR reduction. This patient, on the other hand, has a severest um, cardiomyopathy, markedly dilated left ventricle. And with an ear of 30 millimeters squared, he probably will not benefit from MR reduction. He probably needs either a VAD or a transplant or a hospice care. And it just so happens that in mitra FR, they enrolled more of these patients, where in COAPT, we enrolled more of these patients. 
Now, the second reason, as I mentioned, is that the heart failure medications were not maximized or optimized in MITRE-FR, and they were allowed to vary in the two groups, and differences in heart failure medications um, were likely used, and that heart failure medications do affect prognosis in this disease, where in COAP, we had very few changes in background heart failure medications. And third, and very importantly, um, the MITRE-FR trial was the registration trial for the MITRE-CLIP in France. And there hadn't been a lot of use of the MITRE-CLIP before. Um, whereas in COAPT, where we did this in mainly the United States, we had used this in, for a decade now in more than five different studies. And as a result, the success rates were higher in COAPT. The complication rates were about 50% less. And most importantly, more CLIPs were put in in COAPT. And if you looked at the durability, at one year, there was about 17% recurrence of severe MR in MITRE-FR compared to only 5% in COAP. So the technique was actually somewhat better in COAP just because of greater experience. When we looked in COAP at all the different subgroups of whether the patients were low surgical risk, high surgical risk, men, women, young, old, lower, higher LVEFs, et cetera, every group that we could identify had comparable benefit. So last year on March 14th, the FDA approved the MitraClip for treatment of select patients with severe secondary MR who remain symptomatic despite medical therapies, maximally tolerated medical therapies. And I'm not gonna bother reading the entire label, but the bottom line is they accepted the COAP criteria. And that if the patients, if you had an experienced operator and the patients have heart failure with ejection fractions of 20 to 50%, and systolic dimension less than seven millimeters who are still symptomatic despite um, maximally tolerated guideline directed medical therapy, then they are a candidate and would be expected to have reduced death and heart failure hospitalization and otherwise benefit. So this is now made it into the guidelines. And again, I won't go through all this in detail, but again, surgery is not an upfront approach for these patients. The bottom line is saying, do they meet COAP criteria? Do they have severe MR according to a multi-parametric assessment from the US American Society of Echocardiography um, quantitative analysis, which is really an ERA of greater than 30 or pulmonary systolic venous flow reversal in most patients? Um, are they continuing to have symptoms and severe MR despite maximal medical therapy that they can tolerate and CRT if appropriate? If yes, then they should undergo transcatheter mitral valve repair with the mitral clip. So what are the implications of the COAP trial? And I'm, I'm gonna conclude now. I will say that right now this is undergoing CMS review. It's in its final stages and there will be reimbursement for the mitral clip uh, in the United States any day now we're expecting this to come out and we'll understand what the exact criteria are, but we've worked very closely with CMS and they, we expect them to follow very carefully the COAP criteria. So in patients meeting COAP eligibility criteria, the mitral clip is really the new standard of care. So how many patients does this apply to? Well, um, at any one time, there's about six and a half million patients with heart failure in the United States. If we look at the patients with, a, with an ejection fraction of 20 to 50%, that's mitral clip COAP criteria. If we look at those patients who are symptomatic, now we're down, you can see here, to about a third of the patients. If we look at those patients who also have three plus or four plus MR, now we're at about 7% of the patients. And this is data, by the way, we presented to CMS. They wanted to understand that this was gonna cost the country. And then if we look at the ones who are not responding to maximal medical therapy and who have the appropriate anatomy for the mitral clip, we think it's about 3.7% of all the patients with heart failure. So it's only one out of 25 patients with heart failure. It's about a quarter of a million patients per year in the United States, but it's only about one in 25. But for those one in 25, there can be a marked improvement in symptoms, quality of life, reduced heart failure hospitalizations and improved survival. Importantly, COAPT and MITRE-FR provide complementary guidance for patient selection, demonstrating which patients with heart failure and secondary MR are likely to benefit, but also who are unlikely to benefit from MR reduction. Um, and in Europe, 
Functional MR is the number one indication for the mitral clip. It has been for years, even without this data, although they likely are over-treating a lot of patients. So it's equally important not to over-treat as it is to under-treat. The FDA approved and the guidelines support the mitral clip for patients with heart failure and secondary MR, meaning COAP criteria. Strict reliance to these criteria should allow duplication of the COAP results in the real world and avoid over-treatment. And finally, the profound beneficial impact of the mitral clip in patients with heart failure, meaning COAP criteria, has important implications for ongoing and future trials investigating new transcatheter mitral valve repair and replacement technologies. Um, I must say that um, uh, um, people didn't know whether co-op was going to be positive or not, but probably very few people expected it to be this positive. It's one of really um, the more positive um, uh, therapies we have for patients in heart failure and with valve disease. And so now we've got new annual plasty approaches, transcatheter mitral valve replacement, et cetera, and they've got to be a, compared to the mitral clip in appropriate patients, because not only is the mitral clip that effective, but it's also extremely safe. And many of these trials are ongoing right now. So I'm going to stop here, I think, and uh, I'd love to uh, take some questions uh, if you guys have any. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Dr. Stone. So let's open it up to questions. Maybe if people start to put some in the chat or... <clears throat> Give it a minute. I doubt I answered all the questions. <laughs> it's a lot of impressive work there. Rick, how do you go about counseling the patients as you see them as they come in for these type of procedures? I was curious. So, uh, you know, again, the, the real key thing is to try to understand what's causing their mitral regurgitation. And sometimes it's not quite as simple as I described where it's primary versus secondary. Sometimes there's combinations. Um, um, you know, especially when you say you've got somebody with long-standing primary MR, they can develop heart failure and LV dilatation over time from left ventricular dilatation. Then they've got a component of mitral leaflet tethering. So the first thing you got to do is figure out what the predominant underlying cause is. Uh, and then you have to go through the types of assessment. You obviously, they'll end up having a TE echo in addition to transthoracic echo to determine the etiology. Um, the ejection fraction, uh, a right heart cath for pulmonary pressures, exclude concomitant coronary disease, um, amyloid or other conditions. Um, and then if it really comes down to pure mitral regurgitation, you talk to them with these three options. And for some patients, medical therapy is perfectly appropriate. Those are the patients with heart failure who have not yet tried to been optimized. And um, um, we were very careful in COAP to reject patients who were not from an eligibility committee who were not yet on maximally tolerated medical therapy. And many of those patients would get better. Um, their symptoms would disappear and their MR would go from four plus to two plus just by putting them on beta blockers and uh, um, ACE ARBs or ARNIs. Entresto works very well in these patients. So you have to give them a good medical um, effort. Then if they um, have done everything they can, and not all these patients can tolerate, you know, ACE, ARBs or ARNIs or beta blockers, et cetera. But if you've given it your best shot, um, and if they don't have the indications for CRT, um, et cetera, then if they still are symptomatic and if they still have severe MR, then the mitral clip is very appropriate. And um, we've got very skilled operators at Mount Sinai. Um, uh, Dr. Kinney in particular does most of the procedures. Um, and so they should be referred. If on the other hand, it's primary mitral regurgitation, 
Again, there we've got strong surgical indications and we wanna operate earlier rather than later. Again, even for, um, uh, uh, it's gotta be severe MR. The only indications are for severe MR, but even if the patients are asymptomatic, we wanna operate as soon as we start seeing morphologic changes um, in the heart. So increased pulmonary pressures, atrial fib, uh, reduced EF, uh, et cetera. And so here, you know, again, we've got some of the most skilled mitral surgeons, uh, you know, in the world with David Adams and Gilbert Tang and others. And so we want to refer them um, uh, for surgery early. And again, the beauty is, is that um, our surgeons will almost always be able to do a successful repair. And for primary MR, the outcomes are much better for repair than replacement. Uh, occasionally, you know, they'll need a replacement or occasionally they'll feel the patient is too high risk to undergo surgery. Uh, in which case, if they're really that extreme high risk or prohibitive risk, then many of those patients can benefit symptomatically from a mitral clip. The real hot topic right now is what about intermediate risk DMR patients? Um, let's say that have an STS score of four or 6%. Um, uh, right now we've gotten so good with the mitral clip, there are many people that think now that should be a valid indication for mitral clip as opposed to surgery. And many patients of course would rather have the mitral clip because it's such an easy procedure. And there are two randomized trials ongoing right now of intermediate risk DMR patients randomized to mitral clip versus mitral valve repair. So we'll see what happens with those trials. Gotcha. Interestingly, Andy Dunn just put a, a question in about does the mitral clip ever dislodge or embolize? Yeah, great question. Uh, and the answer is in terms of embolizing, uh, almost never. I mean, there's been one or two cases ever reported of mitral clip embolization. But the most common complication of the mitral clip is that, remember, it holds the two leaflets together. And the most common complication is that occasionally one of the leaflets can pull out. So the mitral clip stays attached to the other leaflet so it doesn't embolize, but with one of the leaflets pulling out, you once again get recurrent MR. And that's one of the failure modes. That occurs in about two to 3% of patients. Um, and when we talked about the major complications where I showed you it was 3.4%, that's what's called single leaflet um, attachment. And that was the most uh, common cause of that 3.4%. It's about 2% of patients. Gotcha. That was a good question from Dr. Dutton. It was. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? If not, we're getting close to the into the hour and really wanted to thank you, Dr. So what a great presentation. I think everyone really enjoyed it. So thank you very much for the day. Good, my pleasure. Thanks everyone. Have a great day and stay safe.